We gotta do an intro. Yeah, do you wanna... <laughs> Can we play uh, Iron Maiden Run for the Hills? Is that too much? Just to let people Run know that this is... Run for your life. See, he didn't think we were gonna get it, did yeah. he? <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. You're listening to Tongue Benders, the sound designer's podcast. Let's do this. Welcome to Tone Benders. My name is Renee Coronado, and with me today, as always, it's Tim Muirhead. Hey, Tim. Hey, Renee. How are you doing in this crazy world? Well, again, that's a loaded question. <laughs> so- yeah, everything's <laughs> gone upside down. This world is nuts. What do we got on the show today? We got a cool interview from a thousand years ago, back in January, when we went to Austin, um, and we met up with a really cool guy, Tim Ricosi, frequent collaborator with Robert Rodriguez, also works a lot um, on Adam Sandler films, um, and just an Austin staple and a really cool guy. Yeah, Tim is someone that I'm really happy we got to interview in person because of all the people we've talked to on this podcast, well, everyone we've talked to has always been wonderful and great, but Tim uh, really seemed to click with us. We got along really well right from the start. We were making jokes and pop culture references that uh, a lot of people wouldn't be getting. We're clearly from the same vintage and had a lot of uh, the same references growing up. You know, you two hit it off like on a different level too, because right afterwards we went to the record store and the two of you were going into some deep cuts that were just flying right over my head. Yeah, Tim and I have a very uh, strange affinity for 90s indie rock, completely obscure bands. (laughs) I got to talk to him about some bands that no one else knows about anymore. It's been lost in time, but he and I were able to uh, talk about our favorite albums by these bands that no one cares about anymore. (laughs) Yeah, so I would like to uh, hang out with Tim many more times in the future, and hopefully when the world goes back to normal, we can uh, find our way to Austin, or maybe Tim can come visit one of us, because uh, it was a wonderful day spending time with Tim. He was just a cool guy, and he made me laugh the whole time. So to give a little bit of a backstory, uh, Tim Ricosi, you'll know him from his work on Alita Battle Angel, Sin City, many more Robert Rodriguez films. But before we get to talking to him, a little backstory on how this interview came to be, because it was a whirlwind. Oh yeah, good point. So in January 2020, earlier this year, before COVID times hit, I jumped on a plane from my home in Toronto and flew to Austin, Texas. Renee jumped in his car from Dallas and drove up to Austin, and we met for the very first time. We've been doing this podcast for almost 10 years and we'd never actually met in person and 10 minutes after we met for the first time in person we had three different interviews lined up so we met said hi and then did a three hour long interviews for the podcast you may have heard some of them one was with tom hammond about working with richard linkletter Uh, we did an interview with brad engel king about his work on terrence malick's a hidden life we did an adr round table with emma butt and Shayna brown and we also did another round table about people working in atmos for the first time So we did all these interviews. I'd just flown in, just met Renee. Then we went out to a bar for an Austin audio meetup and we met all these amazing people doing super interesting things in audio. And it was one of the most fun and exhilarating days I've had in a really long time, but it was exhausting. So I finally got to bed in the middle of the night, conked out, and the next day in the morning, we had an interview with Tim Ricosi. And I gotta be honest with you, I was wiped out. I had no energy at all. But then we met Tim for the first time and quickly realized that energy was not going to be an issue at all. (laughs) Tim is an infectious person to be around. He was so much fun that we could not help but get excited for this talk. He's the kind of guy we could have spent days with arguing the merits of obscure 80s action films. Yes. (laughs) So without further ado, let's go to Tim Ricosi and uh, cut to the interview. Let's tee it up, Renee. So the conversation with Tim Ricosi began with the question of how he got started. So you started in L.A. and then New York, or where did you start out? I was always going to work in film. I worked in a video store all four years of high school, went to college, worked in a movie theater, graduated, worked in a TV station where I helped the entertainment reporter write questions for the press junket. Okay. I've seen so many movies and things, and I'd be like, hey, ask Sam Jackson about his golf game or something (laughs) non-related to the movie that I thought would help the person on the press junket maybe break the ice a little bit. And after working there for... I don't know, a year or two after college, everyone was like, you should go work on movies. That's obviously where your interests were. And I was like, it is? 
<laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, being s- sort of young and impressionable, I just went out to Los Angeles. I wasn't trying to get into sound. I didn't go to school for sound. I graduated from Indiana University with a degree in telecommunications. So I was just like, hey, this is what I'm is here to do. Is that like broadcasting? It's Tele- broadcasting. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I went into television immediately after college. That was more accessible. There's no film in Indiana. There's yeah. plenty of television stations, but not a film studio or anything. So I ended up going to Los Angeles where I started, of all places, at Creative Cafe as a runner. I'd been in Los Angeles four weeks, and I went on an interview at Creative Cafe, and they said, how long have you been interested in sound? And I was like, my whole life. (laughs) Of course, my whole life. And they were like, well, how well do you know Los Angeles? And I'd been there four weeks, and I go, I know Los Angeles great. You know, Inside out. Exactly. And and this is back in the days of like the Thomas Guide was how you got around Los Angeles. No Mm -hmm. apps, no phone apps and everything. But Creative Cafe was owned by Steve Flick. Do you know Steve? Have you talked to him? No, we haven't, but... uh, Legend. You should talk to him. He's amazing. And he's worked on so many things. And it just was kismet that I just ended up being at this place where I get to the end of my day, and then I sit in with the editors, and they just let me sit in the back and just watch. And that was my college learning, was Mm -hmm. just sitting and observing people. And occasionally I would speak up, and Charles Maine's work there. There you go. Yeah, he's been on our pod. Yeah, a lot of great people. And there were also a lot of people my age that were graduating from college and were starting off. And your age was 20-ish? I was probably like 25 yeah. at the time. And who else was there? Addison Teague. Oh, wow. Peter Brown. Do you know Peter? I, I'm aware of him, but yeah. Downtown Peter Brown, the <laughs> professor of sound. Um. <laughs> My current dialogue editor, David Butler, was there. John Michaels, who supervises. Jamie Hart, Greg Ten Bosch, Ryan Juggler. It was odd that 20 years ago, 25 years ago, all of these people would start and stick with it. Mm -hmm. We're all still working. A lot of the people, we all work together and just sort of kind of kept in touch with each other. None of us are sort of on each other's crews, except David Butler and I, but we've all sort of managed to stay in the sound game. Mm -hmm. So I think that's sort of testament maybe to Steve Flick, because we all went separate way and took what we Mm -hmm. learned from him. So I worked there for about five years as an assistant. Okay. And I think I did something like six movies a year. One day you would be working on one thing and, oh, hey, this thing's going to the stage. You're working on this movie now and stuff. It was great because every day would be something different, but it's another facet of assisting and being part of things. Hey, we need you to go to the stage today and you're doing this. Hey, you're conforming today. Great. Mm -hmm. Cue sheets. Oh, (laughs) cue sheets. Popping mag. That's a thing that uh, <laughs> not anymore. I like to tell the kids about. <laughs> All right, spell it out. What's popping mag? What is it? Popping mag is uh, when you lay everything back to two inch. When I came in, we were moving away to completely all digital, but there were still things like on Starship Troopers, all of the guns were still on mag. So you could get that saturated sort of analog sound mm-hmm. and stuff. And to pop it, you'd have to put it on the reels and then find out where the two pop was and then mark backwards and stuff. So if they could cue everything up in the back room at the stage. And if you didn't, somebody in the back room would stop and come out and ask who the idiot was that <laughs> didn't do it. And so it was good. So it was like a crash course where you got to work on all kinds of different films, action films, talkie films, small independent films. And they would let you cut, you know, if you were interested in cutting. Some people were interested more in assisting full time. And so it was a good crash course in doing a lot of things. And then after that, I was like, you know what, I'm going to try and branch out and see who else around town I can work with. And I was interested in traveling. I met up with the sound supervisor, Leslie Schatz. Okay, yeah. And Leslie is a great guy and said, hey, I'm going to do a show in New York for Gus Van Zandt. Not all assistants were willing to pick up and travel, especially I wasn't married or had any kids. So I was like, great, let's do it. That sounds great. And plus, Gus Van Zandt. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Let's go talk to Gus Van Zandt. So I went to New York. The third day that I was there, I came out of the subway and the second plane hit the towers. Oh, whoa. And it was September 11th. Holy moly, that took a turn. Uh, (laughs) This will (laughs) not turn into a very special episode of (laughs) Tone Trust me. We're not going to go there. But it happened, and naturally, as you can imagine, an event like that caused some serious introspection. Do Mm -hmm. I want to do this? You know, do I want to live in a big city anymore? So we were supposed to be there for three months. We condensed the post schedule to like three weeks. And it was very weird because I was like five blocks away 
Hmm. We had to walk through. We had to show ID to military police holding assault rifles. They had blocked the streets off. When you condensed the schedule, was it because did you have to like pause for a while and re relocate or or were you just trying to get through it fast? We were just trying to get through it fast. We were sort of like, let's just get this done with at this point. So we'd go to work and it was eerily quiet in New York in those three weeks afterwards. We ended up wrapping up. We went to Toronto, mixed the movie, and then I went back to Los Angeles where I was immediately starting on OG Spider-Man, Sam Raimi Spider-Man. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was over at Sony and I was loading dailies. When I went back to Los Angeles, it was hard to go back because I had experienced something that everybody that I worked with had not. Mm -hmm. PTSD. So at the time I was thinking, okay, I'll stick it out. We'll keep doing stuff. But I was uneasy with sort of living in a big city. But I'd spent my whole life wanting to work on films. And here I am working on Spider-Man with Sam Raimi. I love the evil dead. You know, this is yeah. amazing. And I was walking across the parking lot and someone said, hey, you travel. You're an assistant. You travel, right? And I was like, yeah, I have. And they said, Robert Rodriguez is building a mix stage in Austin. Do you think you'd be interested in going down there and doing two shows? It's probably going to be about a year. And you couldn't have thrown me a bigger life preserver at the time. Wow. It was sort of like Tom Waits' Bone Machine. Do you know that song? Like, what's he building in there? Mm -hmm. I was like, Robert Rodriguez is building a mix stage? Hmm. (laughs) Very interesting. And I've always been attracted to Robert from one of the first movies I worked on was the documentary Full Tilt Boogie. Okay. uh, Which is about the making of Dust Till Dawn. Okay. And some behind the scenes. And it's about his crew. And the thing (laughs) to me about film medicine, a community is just everybody getting together and doing this thing. And you can't stop a whole group of people that have the same creative intentions Mm -hmm. and stuff. So if everyone puts their mind to it, we can do this. So it became a no-brainer for me. So when you got here, was Robert Rodriguez's studio already built or were you helping build it? Finishing touches were just being So is this the studio that you hear about that's in his garage? This is the garage, yes. Okay. And it's a legitimate garage. He used to park in the garage. Is this the garage of where he works or where he lives? Uh, Or is that the same place? (laughs) It's the garage where he works. Um, But is it his house? It's on his property, yes. Wow, okay. So he's building the stage for the purposes of a couple specific films, which are? Uh, Spy Kids 2, Yep. which we ended up pre-dubbing here and then finaling at Skywalker. And then we print mastered Predators, and we did a week of Predators out at Warner Brothers. And then Alita, we did the whole final mix at Fox. Mm -hmm. So, but everything else, all of the TV shows, the other movies have all been finished in the garage. (laughs) Yeah. So you brought up Predators, which is obviously related to the original Predator from the 80s. Yes. When you were working on that, did you try and relate the new movie sounds to the old movie? Or were you just looking at it as a fresh slate? No, we were trying to, but the thing about Predators is there's multiple Predators. Mm -hmm. There's new incarnations and stuff. So the tricky thing is is you have to, well, first of all, you have to get the original Predator right. Because if you don't get that right, then people are like, no, what is this? This is a sham and stuff. And to be honest, it took us up to maybe the week before finaling to just tune it in. Paula Fairfield, who's on my crew, worked yeah. on that. Paula's been on our podcast. The She's dra- great. Mother of Dragons. Yes. And she kept doing iteration after iteration. The thing with Robert and I, and I think one of the connections that we have is we're roughly the same age, so we have the same pop cultural touchstones. And a lot of times whenever we talk to each other or he gives me notes, it's often in the form of referring to another movie, mm-hmm. which is great. You know, it's sort of a shorthand that you can go, oh, the problem is is sometimes our nostalgia for things clouds the actual <laughs> memory for things. So there was a time where he said, hey, let's make this creature sound like the head in the thing that sprouts legs and walks away and stuff. And I said, okay, great. I just so happen to know the person that designed that sound effect for the thing. There you go. So I gave Dave Udall, rest in peace, a shout out. And I said, hey, can you send me some of those elements? And he was more than happy to. And I cut him in and I put it in there and I played it for Robert. And he was like, no, that's not quite it. (laughs) (laughs) And so you learn over the years. You learn. That's the close. This is the shorthand. This is how we're going to get to what it sounds like. And then we'll tweak it, you know, which is sort of like Robert's M.O., anyway is to take the movies that he grew up on and everything gets refracted through the prism of robert then 
And so everything's a big mishmash of here's a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And it's the dim sum of (laughs) cinema. So I think as far as our idea with Predators was you have the main Predator, which is very big. But then the other Predators have to be bigger. They're more intimidating (laughs) and stuff. So that's just a general lesson of being able to, when working on a dynamic mix of knowing what you want to be your biggest moment in the reel. And if you go for it too early, then you're going to have to walk it back later. So it was just a good learning experience to have to deal with somebody else's property, something else that somebody created, and then reverse engineer it into your own project. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure that I've watched all the Predator movies. Everyone that's taken a stab at it nailed it. My, Steve Flick, my boss, did a Predator movie. And when I saw him over at Warner Brothers when we were mixing it, he was like, oh, what are you doing over here? And I was like, oh, we're mixing Predators. And he goes, oh, yeah, everybody's got to do a Predator movie. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a little bit like you could set it with Terminator too, right? You could do that, yes. <laughs> Everybody's got to do a Marvel movie. Yeah. <laughs> Sooner or later, we all do an Avengers film. So you were the super on Alita Battle Angel. I was. Co-super. I co-supered with Craig Hennigan. Okay. Yep. What's the day-to-day like when you're in the middle of a project like that? You know, for me, it's interesting because although I don't start on the film officially till it's over, living down here and having access to Robert and the studio allows me a lot more interaction with the project than I normally would have on a movie if I lived like in while Los they're Angeles. shooting. Right, while they're yeah. shooting and stuff. So I will go to the set. Um, I'll see what's going on. This is a family down here. So I know the first AD, I can call him up and say, you're going to have a crowd on the set. Can we record chants and stuff? And set it up with them ahead of time. We did that on Alita and recorded for the motorball stadium scenes. We recorded at a high school football stadium at two in the morning. (laughs) And that's like one of the things that you're like, we're never going to get 5,000 people together to sit and chant. But, you know, if you know the AD and you can work out and let them know a week ahead of time, I made a list of these are the chants we need. We want cheers. We need boos. We need groans. And so by planning and being able to sort everything out, we were able to get out there, knock it out, 15 minutes. That's the advantage of knowing the people on the crew and being able to, to work on uh, the movie while it's being shot. Usually the second that Robert announces something, he usually maybe a day or two before will text me and say, hey, we're doing Sin City. Hey, we're going to do Alita. And these are all two that I knew Sin City backwards and forth. That was a huge comic book for me growing up. I was familiar with Alita Battle Angel because I enjoy manga and anime. So it wasn't a foreign thing to me. That seems to be the big thing with my crew is the earlier that I get on, the more that I can start prepping them for this thing that they don't know Mm -hmm. what it is. They don't know what Alita is. So I'll send them the books. You know, I'll send them a link. Anything I can do to give them the sort of information beforehand that I have that um, will inform their sound decisions whenever they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Not to get too into process at this point right now, but the first pass that I have my editors do, I try to give them very little direction because I find it more interesting to see what they're going to give me. And I feel like I've talked to them about things in phone conversations and in sending stuff that they're aware enough to make an informed, cutting, creative decision. But I don't want to box them into a corner and say, this is what I want and that's it. Because what's the point then? Let them what they turn over may be far better than anything Mm -hmm. that I get back. So the other thing that I do is I spot things. I say, hey, this is what you're going to cut. And if you have time and you feel compelled, cut anything else in the reel you like. You can take a swing at anything you want. One, that gives me more options when I get to the stage and stuff. And two, when you're working on something and you're assigned things and you're like, oh, cool, it's a chase scene. Oh, I'm doing the punches. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wanted to do the vehicles and everything. So I'm like, hey, you're doing the punches. But if you have a cool texture... Yeah. It just sits in here nicely. Send the texture. Just If you know a little sweetener that's going to pick this up that somebody else cut. So it's weird to talk about things and be like, so who cut this and who cut <laughs> this? Because when we get to the final product, everybody really cut part of everything. There's a little bit of everybody in each thing. That's fantastic. The other thing about dealing with properties that are based on comics and manga is that... When you're reading comics, there's a lot of onomatopoeia. Yes. There's a ton of just sound words that are very unique to comics. 
they're words, they're letters, right? So they're not sounds that you're referencing, but I bet that helps a lot when you're directing people as far as like where they're going to start at, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because the properties that Robert chooses to work on sort of fit his sonic philosophy, which I'm not sure if I go into any great detail other than to me, it sort of represents like a power chord, (laughs) you know? Robert writes everything, he directs everything, he does the music. So when we're on the stage, it's sometimes like, am I dealing with the writer? Am Mm. I dealing with the musician? Am I dealing with the director or the producer? You know, and so he's able to wear his hats on a lazy Susan and just keep turning them and turning them and do whatever. I know that his music is important to him. When he writes something and it's got a cue that works with things, I know, you know what? I'm going to back off on the sound effects in this scene because this is music's moment for this. The eternal question of music versus things, well... Music wins. Music always wins. <laughs> music always wins. And I'm kind of fine with that. As somebody that loves movies, mm-hmm. to me, I just want to tell the best story with sound possible. If I spent three days cutting something and we get to the stage and then everyone's like, mm, not great, then I'm like, okay, not great. Let's mm-hmm. wipe it and let's go on and try something else in there. So Robert, as you mentioned, is writing music. Multiples of the films, he's credited as one of the re-recording mixers. Right. He's also got sound editing credits, I believe. So he's not your average director that people are working for. He's not like, can you move it a little bit later? He probably knows exactly what he's Uh, talking about. or, Or he'll just do it himself. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and that's something too. He knows how to, you know, when you own your board and you know how to work and things. I would hope over the years that his hands on experience, as far as sound goes, has somewhat reduced. We've sort of learned his style, the Robert Rodriguez mm-hmm. film style, and he doesn't have to come in and do everything himself. Uh, it's interesting. I know I'm the supervisor. I don't supervise other films, mostly because Robert, one, keeps me so busy, but it takes so much out of you to supervise. Yeah. I want to cut, too. It's hard to (laughs) cut whenever you're supervising stuff. If you're an editor and you don't have to go to the stage and you're not the supervisor, you're just a person that's cutting and you get to cut at home, you, my friend, have a blessed life. (laughs) That's the dream right there. I look at my position, especially with Robert, as sort of a sous chef. I'm here to gather all of the elements together. I'm here to prep everything, lay it out, and wait for him to come in on the mix date, dip the spoon in the sauce, taste Tell it. Tell you what he likes. Chef's kiss, <laughs> print master. Let's go. <laughs> so the other good thing about him being so hands-on and knowing things is you can't BS him. Yes. I like the fact that you can be a straight shooter with him and say, the reason this doesn't work is this and not some technical mumbo jumbo that we say to people to try and buy time while somebody figures out why the system crashed. Turn the placebo knob. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Everybody has their go-to sort of like, hey, distract the clients while we sort this out. But the great thing with Robert is he's like, "Mm, I'll be back. Let me know when you guys get this sorted out. So you talk about being a super as, as the goal that a lot of people kind of aspire towards, but it's also exhausting. What elements of it are Just spell out for people that don't really understand what it's like to be a super on a project. Like, what is it? Well, I'm in Austin. None of my other crew... Well, I have a a sound editor here, Clark Crawford, and now this is where I'm going to name my crew so they all get shout outs. Uh, (laughs) Angelo Palazzo is in Los Angeles. Paula, who I mentioned, is in California. David Butler is in Los Angeles. David Bach works with us on ADR from time to time. Craig? Craig, who is like... Craig Hannigan. Craig Hennigan. Yeah, we should talk about Craig Hennigan. So I did some minor research on IMDb, and Uh it looks like you guys worked together on The Mummy 2 in 2001. That's the first one I could find you guys overlapping on. You're both assistant editors on that. Right. So you've been in each other's circle for a while. Yeah. The first time that we met each other, I walked in and I was like, hey, how are you and stuff? And he was like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm Craig. I'm from Toronto. And I would assume you're, you're from Toronto, so I'm really trying everything I can do to become an honorary Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way, you know, a lot, you of, learn to a, skate. Lot, a lot of Canadians came down, you know, to do post sound and stuff in California. I'm trying to become an honorary Canadian so I can actually be a part <laughs> of my, the true North Fold. So I said to Craig, you know, what have you worked on? And it's like, oh, nothing you would know. I worked with this director named Vincenzo Natalie. 
and I was like, did you work on Cube? Oh, there you go. And he was like, how? We've lost Renee. How do you know Cube? <laughs> Are you a Cube fan, Renee? No, he doesn't know. Oh. Clue free. <laughs> I confess my You're ignorance. in for a treat now, Renee. Right, I'm in. Okay. And the joke is nobody's mentioned Cube to him since and stuff, <laughs> so it was sort of fortuitous. <laughs> Cube is a Canadian sci-fi film from maybe 99, maybe? 98, I 98? think. 98? Okay. Yes. And it's uh, a really smart idea to make... It basically takes place in one room. It's an escape room. Yeah. Movie. Well, now, yeah, but yeah. escape rooms didn't exist back then. Exactly. So it's a really smart way to make a cool movie on a low budget. I've seen like the Korean version of that film, like not of that film, but I've like yeah. I've seen mm-hmm. that concept. It's super compelling. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Intense. It, and it sort of set off a series because then we got like Saw and mm-hmm. all of the sort of everyone's trapped in a room thing. And now we have escape room movies. So, mm-hmm. but it just became this thing that over the years, starting from when I was working in a video store in high school, every five years, I've set a goal for myself to try and watch 365 movies in a year. I don't always do it. I would yeah. think like normally we all probably watch probably 100 at least movies, yeah. but to focus in and say, hey, I'm going to log these and I'm going to keep track. And, and I've I, done this exact thing. I haven't done it in a while, but when I was in my 20s, I did it multiple you times. You want to see, and I've kept up with it. It's kind of like, I'll do this every year. And then you can't, no, you would have no life then if you did it. But every five years seems to be a good time to one, catch up on mm-hmm. the last movies of the last five years. And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of movies over the years and it's helped me immensely in my career because people like to be flattered by, you know, people realizing that they've worked on. But for me, working in sound, it's sort of interesting just to see what everybody else is doing. That's the, you know, inspirational to me is to listen to things and go, I never would have thought about using that sound for this thing right there. Also, we don't make talky mumblecore movies. I love mumblecore movies, but we don't do those. We make big, loud, immersive, bombastic adventures. So I think I'm always sort of amused by trying to see how do you do a quiet film? Yes. You you know what? Ad Astra from last year. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite sound jobs because all of the loud parts of that movie are quiet (laughs) and the quiet parts are loud. And I'm like, how do you? It's an amazing feat for me, and it's something that I've seen that movie like two or three times already, and I'm just sort of taken by, huh, it's almost a magic trick. I'm like, how did they they do this? But that's the great thing when if you watch movies all the time, then it just becomes your own film school, and you're sort of becoming aware of things that before you watch the movie, you didn't know existed. So not being in Los Angeles, we don't get movies opening weekend here in Austin We're not necessarily getting things when they come out and stuff, but eventually everything comes to Austin and there's such a big film scene in Austin with the Draft House and South by Southwest. And hands down, if you've not been to Fantastic Fest, you have to come down one year and and do that because it's one of the best film festivals. You'll not have a better time than those couple of days. So, uh, but yeah, Austin's just a great place for film. I knew we were going to get sidetracked many times during this conversation. It's all the good. sidetracks are sometimes more fun than the tracks. <laughs> <It's> true. <laughs> so Craig is my brother from another mother, and we are the type of friends that we can go years and not touch base. Neither one of us are social media dudes. So I think we went a couple of years, and when we got back together and talked, I was like, hey, I got married. And he was like, hey, I got married too. <laughs> but we didn't think about like maybe over the years. And then I was like, well, I don't have any kids. And he's like, but I have one. I go, you do? When did you have a kid? You know, so it's that kind of thing. We're not day to day. But the second that we talk to each other, we pick right up where we left off. And uh, we get each other's references. We're roughly the same age too. And so it always helps to be able to throw a Tim Hortons reference in there and <laughs> bring him back in. Yeah. You know, when he loses focus, just... Phil Kessel, I yell out, and he <laughs> comes back in. So You know what you're doing. Yes. You know what you're doing. So what about Craig made you want him on Alita? Craig's worked on big superhero films before, and Alita was a slightly bigger scope than we Definitely, had done. Definitely, yeah. It was also our first Atmos film, and so I wanted somebody that could kind of walk us through the process from the beginning. The thing about Atmos is, If you start off thinking about Atmos when you begin, you're in much better shape than if you 
mm-hmm. get to the end or halfway through it and you're like, no, how are we going to reconfigure these <laughs> sessions? So Craig was great at sort of explaining and like walking me through how to lay things out in sessions for Atmos and what to put there, what's the best way. And the great thing about Craig is he can teach you things in just normal conversations that you may not realize that you're learning mm-hmm. things, but it'd just be a casual, oh, and then do this. And then you're like, oh, that was a little helpful pointer. It's always good to have somebody outside your world that you can bounce ideas off of. You can talk to about plugins, microphones, just somebody that you trust. Mm -hmm. My complete success as a supervisor is I'm not afraid to ask somebody if I don't know the answer to anything. And I'm perfectly willing to admit that I don't know everything. Mm -hmm. So it's helpful to me if you go back to that group of guys that I talked to at Creative Cafe 25 years ago, that you can go back to this source of knowledge of people that have worked on Avatar, Fast and Furious, and Aquaman. I think Steve Martin says in the Lawrence Kasdan movie Grand Canyon, all of life's answers can be found in the movies. Well, sometimes all of Post Sound's answers can also be found in the movies. So, so did he bring you like an, an Atmos mixing template or at least a, a signal flow kind of starting point? Yeah, he has an Atmos template that he works with, and we hand that out to the editors, and we have everybody work within the same template. Yeah. So to go back to the concept of open source filmmaking and the exhausting thing (laughs) is my job as a supervisor, having to keep everybody informed on the same page and aware of what's going on. And it's difficult with everybody being spread out, like I said. Fortunately, now we have a good Slack app going and stuff, and that allows everybody to sort of not only talk to me, but editors talking to each other. And that's great, too, and sort of like makes me happy whenever I get the Slack statistics, and it's like, your editors have had so many conversations amongst each other. And I'm like, oh, thank goodness. They're at least communicating without me. So if you give the people the tools, let them use them, I think that's sort of the interesting way. When we started out here in 2000, internet speeds were not great. (laughs) We would have to FedEx picture drives overnight to editors. There are certain things that technology has really helped sound. Anything that clears workflow and allows you just to be creative, amazing. I mean, leaps and bounds over, I think, the last 10, 15 years of the things that have developed. Sound people that have said, you know, this is great, but maybe I'm going to create a plugin that helps sound people or a sound database program. Sound libraries. Are you kidding me with sound libraries? I mean, I have been on a mixed stage. I've been working at like two in the morning in the middle of the woods in Texas. <laughs> and like my kingdom for a pogo stick. <laughs> now you go, hey, do you want six volumes of pogo sticks? Here you go. And it's amazing. And people are doing great with all of the things. So to start off, I like to take the first couple of weeks and just record as much stuff as possible. Craig and I had eight weeks on Alita. Alita is a rare bird because all of Robert's shows, you know, the philosophy, you can have it good, fast, or cheap, pick two. When you work for Robert, you learn to do all three. (laughs) It's not a choice. Pick three. Right. (laughs) Good, fast, or cheap. No choice. There you go. You're going to get all three. Um, Alita, we have like a year to work on Alita. Unheard of for a Robert sort of production. It's due to, you know, visual effects and everything, but they, thank God, kept the sound team on to allow us to take the time and rework it. One of the advantages of having Craig on the show co-supervising is he's in California, I'm in Texas, picture department's in California, so if they want to run a reel of something, one of us is there to do it. If Robert wants to watch something in the screening room, I can go over to the Troublemaker Studios and sit with Robert and watch him do it. So it kind of put a supervisor in each state and there was somebody on the scene wherever we went. Perfect. Yeah. So when you, for Alita, or I guess any project, when you come on as supervisor, how long are you on the show before you bring on the various sound editors? That's interesting. Every show we've done from the beginning has been different. And that's because we've learned lessons and we've refined it and we've tried Mm -hmm. to streamline and make it better. We've not done two shows back to back the same way. Even if it's, hey, we're using a different mixing template this time. It's the last show. Oh, that mixing template burned us. Okay, well, then we're going to fix it on this show. Mm -hmm. So there's always evolving overall from show to show. When we started off back on, let's say, Sin City, 
I would start about a week before my crew, just because of keeping budgets down and everything like that. Now that we've done some things and we can refine things and know, hey, maybe we don't need as much Foley or maybe we don't need as much ADR on this show. And I prefer ideally to have four weeks. I prefer to be on four weeks before my crew starts. It gives me a chance to cut a general spot. By this point too, I've already been involved during the shoot, not in an official capacity, but I will pull things during the shoot, packs of sounds and send them to Robert. I have a huge selection of movie scores. I'll send him scores to cut to and things that I know that are his taste that knowing the property, oh, these are some good noir sounding Mm -hmm. scores and I'll hook them up with those. And then the first two weeks, I like to cut a temp myself of just everything that I've prepped beforehand, just get sketches of things down. I come from a writing background too, and nobody's ever written the first draft of a screenplay and went, nailed it, (laughs) and sent it off to their agent, you know? And why would you do that with sound? And so I put something down, spend the next day, you hear it again, the next day, you hear it again. The more that you listen to it and revisit, the more you're going to tweak it, the more you're going to make it better, you get other stuff. That's when people are like, why do you need time for sound? Because the more that you listen to it, the more you're going to be able to refine it into a better product, I think. So the second two weeks that I'm on, I like to cue my own Foley. I love Foley, especially if Foley's done well. You don't like bad Foley? (laughs) (laughs) You know who else doesn't like bad Foley? Robert Rodriguez. (laughs) So it took us a few times. And he has a very specific type of Foley that he likes. He doesn't like what he calls teapot foley, which is everything is sort of thin and light and just there and stuff. He likes his foley like he likes his effects. He likes big, meaty, beefy, full spectrum recordings of foley. And it fits in. We had looked for foley people. We had sort of rotated foley people. And then finally I had met Catherine Harper and uh, she's been our foley walker for about 10 years now, I think. So she's great. She gets the thing. She goes above and beyond. We throw everything at her. I don't know if anyone's ever seen the Dust Till Dawn TV show. I just want to say that just pick the finale of any of the three seasons. And they're literally like hour long mini movies. Mm -hmm. The second season ends with like a 40 minute bar fight with vampires and there's trucks, semi trucks crash. And it's crazy. When Robert said he wants to get into television, that's not about the limitations of television. It's what can I do to make television conform to me? Mm-hmm. How can I tell my stories without sacrificing on television? So there's a lot of stuff that's going on there and you have to just be able to work fast. You just have to go. And that's sort of like Robert's MO anyway. Don't overthink it, you know? I think that's sort of like the thing that, that, that's guided us. So doing the Foley, having that out of the way too, having sort of a cut where I've kind of got backgrounds in. By the time my editors come on, it's just about effects from that point on then. Because I'm not sort of, hey, I can't talk to you today because I'm doing this other thing or something. As much as I can clear out of the way before the editors start, that's what I try and get done. And so I'm available to them and accessible. So if they have any questions or We just want to work together on stuff. It becomes a little bit better of a flow. That sounds awesome for the editors to just step into that with everything ready to go for them like that. You know, I just like if we do a temp, you get the temp. And if you're all on the same page, I think it helps the end product that we all end at the same point. I often describe uh, supervising as trying to park an 18-wheeler on (laughs) ice because you have a date that you know that you're going to get to. And at any point, you really can't think about that date. I think week to week, uh, what do we have to get done this week? And as long as I've worked with Robert, Friday's the day that I send him things. Every Friday, whether it's a scene, whether it's, you know, yesterday we were working something and I sent him like a little 16 second revision of a VFX clip. It was something to be like, hey, I noticed this and here it is. Fascinating point. And this is something that people never believe me whenever I tell them this. 20 years, Robert and I never had a spotting session, never sat down. I don't believe you. (laughs) Never sat down and spent six hours or whatever. The spotting sessions are a day long thing. And this is by who Robert is. He's not a person that's going to sit for six hours and talk about this. From the moment that he texts me about it, I'm peppering him with questions. Hey, are the guns going to be like this? Hey, what cars are you using? And how are you peppering them with these questions? Just by text or uh, email? emails? Email? Usually, yeah. We're a big email family, <laughs> I think, and stuff. And that's the other thing. 
when you work with someone 20 years, you kind of know when to email them, when you're going to get a question answered, and when you're not, what's a good time. So by the time we start, I have a pretty good idea of what kind of base that we need to mm-hmm. work from. I may shoot him asking him about different things for two emails, put them all in two emails mm-hmm. so he's not overwhelmed with stuff. But that way I get all of my questions answered and he doesn't have to take 45 minutes out of his day to sit and run a reel with me. So when that information comes back to you, how do you go about kind of parsing it and storing it to where you can go back and access it later? Do you just leave it in email or do you? Yeah, well, I leave it in email. I drop markers in sessions as soon as he um, mentions things and stuff. His scripts have an immense amount of sound notes in them, which is super helpful. Then you have, like you said, the original text with Sin City and the onomatopoeia. We're often doing trailers and, and things while they're shooting for Comic-Con or South by Southwest. And sometimes that involves, here's a scene from the movie and you're cutting it and you have no context for the rest of the movie. But you know, usually I've read the script, I'm familiar with everything. I know exactly what we're dealing with and you can kind of- Do you just keep it in your head though? Or like, where do you keep it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we have the email and it's sort of just, we're really just focusing all on the same project at the same time. We don't have multiple things going. So right. it's sort of like you're dedicated to that channel. Working for Robert, he's so active with things. I mean, he's involved with everything that you find it inspiring that you want to do everything to. I've cut music on the movies fully. I've cut everything on, on Robert's things. I've worked on the set doing VFX. I've painted sets one summer whenever they were prepping for something and I didn't have anything going on in post, but I know the guys that build sets and stuff. And I was like, hey, do you guys need an extra hand? And they were like, great. We've all known each other, you know, like I said. So it's kind of like one of those things that just because I enjoy all of the other parts in the process, you know, I like making music. I like writing. I love to work. And I know this is going to seem like an unpopular opinion, but I also love not working. (laughs) And I think sometimes living in Austin is the thing that benefits me because the cost of living is a little less. I mean, we're getting there. Trust me, people. Don't move here. I'm telling you, please. (laughs) But it's good because just being a family that we all sort of get together and commiserate. So when you talk about when you're non-supervising, one of the people you work with a lot is Elmo Weber. And those are all comedies for the most part, right? They are. But it's a nice change of pace. I do Foley for Elmo. I cue and cut his Foley, which is fun for me because, like I said, it's not super, it takes all of the weight off of it. Mm -hmm. I look at Foley as sort of like the difference, cutting Foley and supervising is like the difference between taking a walk and being strapped to the front of a train, <laughs> you, notice, you notice a lot more whenever you, you can take time and enjoy it. I just find it to be relaxing. There's something zen-like about it. There's something, I'm just here and I'm doing it. And this is silly, but for me, it's kind of like Christmas to get fully back. As somebody that likes to go out and record your own sounds, to be able to get fully back and have your mind sort of your horizons expanded into what can be done. You hear people doing things and I'm like, wait, how did they do this? (laughs) You know, you'll cue things and then they'll be like, hey, we have some time and they'll add a little extra stuff to things. And I'm like, wow, I never thought of that before. But then on the next show, I go, oh, I know that they can do these things. Elmo's amazing. I love Elmo and I love Catherine. The Foley artist. Foley artist, yes. Catherine's married to Elmo. Oh, I did not know that. And I love working on the Sandler movies because they're just fun. It's great. Working on Sandler movies is interesting because now he's done Uncut Gems and I don't know if you've seen that, but there's some cognitive dissonance (laughs) between the Netflix Sandler and the Uncut Gems Sandler. So also Uncut Gems, amazing score. One of my favorite scores of the year. And the track that Skip mixed on that the dialogue on Uncut Gems. I know that we like to all sort of like get wrapped up in space battles and the biggest car chases and gunshots and everything, but the amount of dialogue being balanced and thrown around the room in Uncut Gems is amazing to me. Cool. Yeah. Well, I think we're out of time, unfortunately, but we didn't. I sent you some questions ahead of time. We, we only got through half of them. We didn't even hit them. Yeah, yeah, we're not even not there. Right. But this is fantastic. We didn't even get to take phone calls on, like, yeah. Pirates Baseball <laughs> or Frank Zappa records. I'm here. Like, Joe Dorowski films, line two. Let's do it. We're doing record shopping later. It's going to happen. Yes. Well, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. Thanks for uh, having us. And also a big thanks to Shea Boom for uh, letting us sit in their booth to record this. Absolutely. Yeah, beautiful, yeah. beautiful place. Thanks for having me, guys. Awesome. 
Before we wrap up, I want to send a big shout out, massive thank you to Yvonne Murray, who volunteered to sound edit and mix this episode. She's from Adelaide, South Australia, and she was an absolute joy to work with on this. You can find a link to her IMDb page on our site from this episode. Thanks a lot, Yvonne. If anyone else is ever interested in helping us edit episodes, we need the help. You can reach out to us at info at tonebenderspodcast.com and we would love to work with you to come up with some future episodes. Info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. Have a great one. Tonebenders is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Morrow. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support button.